Okay, so this lecture is going to be on going negative. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know me, I'm going to refresh your memory. I'm Jason. Uh, I'm a debater here at Emory. I'm a rising sophomore. And I am the second negative and first affirmative. So when we're negative, I am the captain of the negative ship. Uh, I go down with it when necessary, but hopefully we generally reach the destination of winning debates. Uh, this is going to be kind of split into two parts. The first is going to be a little bit shorter. I'm going to just call this part being a two-in, being the second negative. What is that like? What are the requirements of that? Uh, then the second part is going to be how to win negative debates. Um, and that's going to be split into kind of three other sections. Then there's going to be kind of like a miscellaneous section that I'm just going to kind of rant for a little bit about how you should practice, what are some other things you can do to get a little bit better at debate. So the first part, uh, being a two-in, I kind of like to think of being a two-in as needing two eyes in the front of your head, four in the back, and one on each side. Uh, the affirmative debater, the second affirmative, can pick their app. So let's say it was a Cuban embargo. And they can research everything they need to know about the Cuban embargo. Their last rebuttal in every app debate will be on the Cuban embargo. Do they need to know a lot about Venezuelan politics? No. Do they need to know about Mexico's energy sector? No. If you are a second negative, you will probably need to know things about those topics this year. You will need to know a lot about each separate country Whereas if you're a second affirmative, you really just need to know about your affirmative. And obviously, you can switch apps a lot during the year, which will require you to know more and more about each app you do. But it's a little bit more selective. The second negative does not necessarily have that choice. The 2N must, if they want to win negative debates, must know a lot about each separate area of the topic. So you kind of have to know a lot about everything. And I think the goal of knowing a lot of things is to, when you walk into a debate, and let's say the affirmative discloses their app, they are like, oh, our affirmative is we're going to pay Venezuela for more oil, or we are going to give them like economic aid to help them with their failing like healthcare sector. Uh, you need to know, the goal is to know more about that affirmative than the second affirmative on the other team. That is truly the goal. When you have accomplished that, and you can point out where their evidence is incorrect, where their arguments are incorrect, and you have internalized these arguments and this knowledge about every single country, and this is very specific to this year, then that is, I think, when you win. And the goal is to win these negative debates. The kind of second requirement of being a second negative that I think is a little bit distinct from being a second affirmative is the type of strategic thinking required. Obviously, the second affirmative, the 2A, has to think strategically, but I think it's really unique for the second negative because you have to plan everything backwards. Everything matter, or the only thing that matters in a negative debate is really the two and R. And setting up that second negative rebuttal is crucial to winning these debates. So that kind of segues me into the second section, uh, how to win negative debates. The kind of theme for this is think from the two and R backwards. Every speech, the one and C, two and C, one and R, all of the cross X's you will have, their goal is to set up the second negative rebuttal to be as strong and strategic as possible to be able to win these debates. The affirmative has a couple of advantages. They get to speak first and last. That allows them to have greater persuasive force, which means the 2 and R has to be able to compensate by being three steps ahead at every single time. So the first part of this is something I call strategery. you got to have strategery in order to be able to plan out these debates. So it's kind of like chess. You want to be thinking several moves ahead. You want to be prepared for what you think the affirmative is going to say. And a lot of that is based on research. But strategery is how you decide to incorporate that knowledge into a successful strategy. Uh, I think the ASA point of this is going to be generic negative arguments. So there are going to be topic specific strategies that you write through the process of research. If I wrote a negative that was all about why the Cuban embargo was good for democracy in Cuba, then that would be a specific strategy tailored towards the Cuban embargo. However, if I write the politics DA, everybody follow me there, if I write the politics DA, that will generally apply 
to every single app I debate because every single app is generally politically unpopular and I can argue for why that disadvantage is very important and I can always have that as kind of like a stock option in my arsenal of negative tools to be able to use against every affirmative. So you're going to want to have generic strategies, whether it's the politics disadvantage, a consult counter plan that you can read in every single debate, another type of counter plan that can literally do the entire affirmative, or some generic criticism argument like the capitalism critique, the neoliberalism critique, and John Turner is going to get into that a little bit more when he gets into his lecture. But you're going to want to have these arguments prepared before every debate, and you can do that over the course of the summer and at the beginning of the season to make sure you're ready to debate at the first term of the year when you may not exactly know what, affirmative, what affirmatives teams are going to be reading. Um, the basic point of this is topic-specific strategies. Uh, I've thought quite a bit about the way and the direction I think this topic is headed. So there's a lot of different areas. Each of the countries is super, super different. So there's not going to be a lot of strategies or topic-specific strategies based off of economic engagement. It's going to have to be a strategy based on the country that it's in. So there are two types of arguments that I think are going to be really, really useful. Uh, the first of them is the conditions counter plan. And I think this is especially effective against the Cuba and Venezuela affirmatives because those countries are functionally our enemies. Neither of them really likes America. And for giving them economic engagement, I think if you remember the conditions counter plan from Bill's lecture yesterday, uh, is everybody kind of following that argument? You know, we will do the plan if you give us something in return. It's also called a quid pro quo strategy. Like, Maybe I'm going to do it, maybe I'm not, kind of depends on you. So for the American sugar farmers, and they have a reason for why, you know, protecting American sugar farmers is good, but they functionally solve the rest of the affirmative. Now, I think these apply to a lot of different types of apps that will be read. We will do most of the app except for one specific thing. We will have a tiny net benefit or a specific disadvantage to that one thing. So I think researching this is going to be really important throughout the year. Uh, the CISA point of strategery is critiques. Uh, Turner is going to talk a lot about these, and I do not want to get kind of too far ahead of ourselves. But critical arguments are somewhat of a, not a necessity or a must-have, but they're very useful to have around in the kind of higher competitive levels of debate, in the top echelons of debate. The second negative needs to be flexible. You cannot just be able to go for the conditions counter plan. You can't just be able to go for the politics disadvantage in case. You have to be able to be flexible to go for a wide range of arguments. And an area that I think people often neglect 
is critical argument or topicality arguments. Being able to go for a wide range of arguments means you can make your 1 and C's more diverse, and it means that you can go for more things that are in that 1 and C, and I'm going to talk about 1 and C construction in a minute. The second part of how to win negative debates is research. And this is kind of my favorite part. It's basically just you have to know what you're talking about. Part of knowing more than the second affirmative about their app means you have to have researched it. You have to have read the literature base about it. You need to know what exactly we're doing with these countries in the status quo or right now. You need to know what exactly are the more persuasive disadvantages in the literature. Now, a lot of y'all have been going through the process of coming up with arguments on your own. But the way that debate kind of takes place in competitive areas such as the novice, junior varsity, and varsity levels is the research, the literature base around these areas kind of guides the way we think about and construct disadvantages. So maybe I had no idea that the Cuban embargo was actually useful for Cuban democracy, but I found a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin that thinks that that is true and he's written several great articles about it. Or maybe I found someone who works for a think tank in Washington DC and she might think that the Cuban embargo is really good for Cuban democracy, but I never thought of that before. You won't really know what to argue for unless you found out what the experts in these individual fields have already discovered and have already argued. I can guarantee you that no matter how much work you think you're doing on any given area, if there is an expert on this area, they will have done more than you over the course of their lifetime of research. And tapping into their knowledge base is really, really, really important for you to be able to incorporate that into your negative arsenal. So that's kind of the research phase. Why that interacts with strategery is you can't kind of map out your strategy until you know what the best arguments are until you know what the strongest arguments are, until you have collected evidence about the kind of core set of arguments you're planning on going for against a certain app. Um, so I think I've already gone into a couple of like specific examples about this, but you, know, you have to be able to know a lot about the topic in order to be able to say what is the best. Uh, I know that's kind of vague, but think about it in the context of each and every country. Unless you know kind of a lot about our current economic engagement with Venezuela or lack thereof, you will be ineffectual at preparing a strategic option to go for against those affirmatives in the 2 and R. Um, we can talk about that if you have a little bit of questions. I do know that part was a little bit vague. Um, the third section, and probably uh, the smallest of these sections in terms of what it contributes to the debate, is execution. So I'm pretty sure there's some level of agreement that like 90% of winning debates occurs outside of the debate round. And this is whether or not you're being negative or you're being affirmative. Execution is the name of this section, and it plays kind of like a minimal role. You have to execute the strategy you've already gone through, and that does seem to be the hardest part and the part that we spend the most time practicing. But honestly, researching takes so long, and planning out strategies with your debate partner or your coaches or former lab leaders through emails is going to be an important part of the negative strategy construction. And executing that strategy is honestly kind of the easier part of this. If you know so much and you are a well-prepared second negative, you will be able to execute your strategy a lot more. The kind of ace of point under here is 1NC strategy. What are you going to put in the first negative constructive? What goes there? Your options in the 2 and R at the end of the debate are constrained only by what you can put in the 1 and C. If I feel comfortable being able to go for a critique, a conditions counterplan, the politics disadvantage, a specific disadvantage to the country, and a T violation that I have all on the 1 and C strategy, does that not make the life of the second affirmative so much harder? Who said yes? You can say yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. Um, if I were the second affirmative, oh. Let's go over that part again. So, what you put in the one and C is going to guide what you are able to go for in the two and R. If it's not the one and C, then I can't introduce it new in the two and R. It has to be there. But if it's going to be in the one and C. I have to feel comfortable enough as a second negative to be able to go for that argument. 
Let's say I put in a critique in my one and Z strategy. It takes my first negative a minute and a half to read. And I know nothing about this argument. I do not think I can go for this argument and win at the end of the debate. Is it of any utility being in the one and C? No. No, it doesn't. Additionally, <clears throat> if I'm the second affirmative, because over time you're going to know different people, you're going to go to camp with different people, and you're going to be able to learn more about what the opponent is able to go for. So let's say I'm debating my lab assistant, Will Mosley Jensen, and he's negative and I'm affirmative, and I know that he is incapable of going for either a counter plan or a critique just because he knows nothing about these arguments. And my second affirmative, I can strategically spend less time on those arguments, making less arguments on those options in order to force him to answer more <laughs> arguments on the strategy he wants to go for. But if he's able to go for a diverse set of arguments that are all in the one and C, I have to think for my second affirmative constructive how to best answer in a balanced manner each and every one of those arguments that could be a threat in the two and R. So the way I kind of described being an affirmative to my lab last night is you gotta protect the AF house. And if the second negative is running at me with a BB gun, I'm obviously going to ignore that person. Just like do your best with your BB gun. But if they're running at it with like a nuke, we'll call that the politics DA, and I know that they can really well go for that, then I'm gonna be a lot more afraid. I'm gonna build my ballistic missile defense, or in this instance, a very large 2AC uh, block to that option. So having a smart 1 and C strategy is part of this execution. The second part of this is splitting the block. So negative block, as I've discussed in my lab, is the 2 and C and 1 and R, but they're back-to-back -back speeches uh, by the negative. Would it make sense if in the 2NC I decided to take the entire politics DA and then in the 1NR my partner did not know that and also started talking about the politics DA for five minutes? No. Communication with your 1N is vital here. This is where you start thinking about the utility of the 1NR, the first negative rebuttal. <laughs> If you, you want to maximize your time as possible, so you have eight minutes in the 2NC, five minutes in the 1NR, maybe in the 2NC I want to take all of the case arguments, and then in the 1NR I want my partner to take the politics disadvantage, then you have a really diverse block. Because they have to answer every single argument that you've made in the 1AR, which is the most time constrained speech, because they have five minutes to answer 13 minutes of arguments. And that is really, really difficult to do. So the more you are able to diversify the arguments within your block by utilizing your first negative rebuttal, the more effective your blocks will be and the higher win percentage you will garner in a lot of these negative debates. Now, the utility of the 1 and R. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here for all of those who are thinking about becoming first negative speakers. This is often considered kind of like the lazy position, the easiest position, because you give your 1 and C, which is usually written for you by the second negative, and then you give your 1 and R, which you have like 10 minutes of preparation time for usually. Don't slack off, 1 ends. Don't slack off. You need to kind of know a little bit about what your negative strategy is. Before the tournament, talk to your 2 end for maybe an hour just about okay, against this country, what are we thinking about saying against this country? What are we thinking about saying? I know X team is reading X affirmative and I think they're really good. We should talk about our negative strategy against them. What am I going to be taking in the one and R? That is the question you need to be able to answer. The one and C is generally kind of like a canned speech. It generally has the set of front lines and shells for your disadvantages, counter plans, your front lines to different affirmative advantage already written. But the 1 and R is something you have to do on your own without the 2 in, and I know that's scary. I know that's scary. I'm a 2 in, and my 1 in Pesci last year was afraid all the time. You have to be able to take a set of, like a diverse set of arguments just like the 2 in. Maybe not as effectively as the 2 in, but you still need to be able to argue. You still need to be able to utilize that time, or else it is literally five minutes of the block, which is the negative's kind of structural advantage in debate kind of goes away or becomes useless. It's a very, very, very important speech. 
Now, the benefit of the one in R is that you have so much preparation time. Let's say that there are two advantages in an affirmative case, and I'm the second negative and these are new advantages and I don't really know that much about them, so I'm gonna take my generic disadvantage or my generic counterplan. I turn to my one end. Mr. One End Pesci, can you look through their case during this preparation time and construct the strongest negative arguments possible against this case? You have like 10 minutes to do so. I'm sure you will be able to come up with a lot more arguments than I will be able to do so in my limited amount of prep time that I want to take before my 2 and C. Does everybody kind of see where I'm going with this? The 1 and R has a lot of time to think through their speech and basically write it out. You can utilize that time for arguments that require more thinking. If that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then be like, no. Nah. Does that make sense? I don't see anybody nodding or shaking their head. So, uh, he's shaking his head. Now everybody's kind of like bobble heading it. Okay. I trust you all. Um, the kind of CISA point of this is two in our choice. Two in our choice. What am I going to go for in the two in R? Um, and I kind of said earlier that the goal of being negative is to think through the debate from the second negative rebuttal backwards. So hopefully your 1 and C and your negative block are all useful in setting up a strong 2 and R. But let's say in the debate, in the negative block, you have two kind of arguments you can go for and you think you can win on. How exactly do you choose? Um, and I think a part of this is thinking about what your opponent is better at answering or has been better at answering in this debate. And if you know your judge, what would your judge kind of prefer to hear? And this is kind of if you feel comfortable going for either strategy in the 2 and R. Uh, but picking is really a very difficult part of these debates. I think it's the hardest part of execution. Um, I know that several times I have lost debates because I've chosen the incorrect strategy in the 2 and R, even though I included a winning strategy earlier in the debate and I just chose incorrectly. Um, and that's definitely kind of like the 2 and's fault. But you know that's something you will get better at dealing with over time because you will kind of figure out who's good at answering what, which judges kind of like my arguments the best, and you'll be able to incorporate that into your speech to make it a little bit more effective. So the kind of last part of this is practice tips. Um, I think that we should not take a lesson from basketball. We are always talking about the game. We are always talking about practice. Um, we should obviously, obviously, obviously practice all the time our negative strategies. Even if I thought of what I would like to go for in the 2 and R against a team, if I'm really, really, really bad at explaining it in the speech, it's going to be not useful for me. So there are three types of ways you can practice your arguments, I think. The first is practice speeches. Give a 2 and C on an argument against a hypothetical 2AC. Just, just do it. You can think of arguments that you think the other team might make. You can think of what you think are the strongest arguments. And practice delivering that speech to your debate partner or to your debate coach and get feedback from it. Where did you need to clean up the explanation? What arguments haven't we thought about against this? This is a very useful part that you can have with your partner because your partner can give you feedback. And that's very, very, very useful. The second one of these is practice debates. If you're on a team, if you're on a squad with more than one team, then you should be debating that team about, you know, like maybe once a week, a couple times a month maybe, uh, once a month even. Just it's all useful. The more debates you have, the more practice you will get. And that is really, 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 really useful and being able to go for your strategies and execute them.
statistics from Alpharetta. And you can kind of know a little bit about those teams as you go throughout the year. And you will be able to gather information about those debaters and about the arguments that they like to present. So you can strategize about them before the tournament. So that is all a process of scouting. Uh, the second kind of tool for scouting is something called the wiki. Um, if you Google uh, NDCA high school debate wiki, W-I-K-I, it'll pull up a web page that has information on basically every competitive team in the country. It will have information generally on what their 1AC is, what they've been putting in their 1NCs, and once you gather that information, not only can you read their evidence ahead of time to see where their evidence is strong, where it's weak, it just allows you to have basic information on what they're saying. So like three days before I leave for a tournament, I can go on the wiki, I can go to Johns Creek, and I can look up what like Johns Creek MF is saying when they're affirmative, and I can start thinking about what I want to say against that particular 1AC. So that type of scouting is very useful and can be done outside of the tournaments. Now, for, I don't know about a lot of y'all, but I know that there's definitely some people here who do not have the benefit of having full-time coaches that they can go to and talk to about how to get better at debate that they can strategize with. I would recommend do not be hesitant to email your lab leaders or other people at camps. Uh, they are really useful. They love debate. Because you're here, they want you to succeed. They like are learning a lot about you, and they care about you as students, and they want you to have effective years competitively after you leave camp. So do not feel afraid to like email your lab leader being like, hey, I wrote this 1AC. I'd like to hear your feedback. Here's the file. What would you say against it? What types of 2AC blocks should I be thinking about? What new advantages could I possibly be writing for this? And they will be happy to give you feedback. And you can all do this post camp. Um, that's especially effective if you do not have a full time coach at your school. Um, the second person that I would recommend emailing is after your debates, particularly if you've lost a debate, uh, get your judges' email and email them a little bit later after the tournament, let a couple days go by, and ask them what could you have done better specifically. And I would bet that most of those judges would be willing to email you back with a list of specific comments about what exactly you, as the debater in the round, could have done kind of individually to improve your chances of winning in these debates. And then kind of something that I, I think I need to remind all of you all about is that the second negative is also the first affirmative, generally. Um, don't neglect your affirmative responsibilities in preparing for negative debates, because half of them will be affirmative. And I know that balance is going to be pretty difficult to find initially. But as time goes by, as the year goes by, you're going to be better able at allocating your time between preparing for negative debates and affirmative debates. I would recommend to those second affirmatives out there to do the same due courtesy to your partner and work on being a first negative. The kind of main speech you want to work on is the negative, the, is the one in R. That speech is so useful, and if it's used correctly, it can really, really, really give you kind of a strategic advantage within the debate. Um, so that's kind of mostly what I have about going negative. If y'all have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Because uh, I know that was a lot of information, and I was probably talking way too fast. So, that means any questions? Yep. Okay, so when, what would you say is like the most strategic thing to usually end up going for in the Chimernata? Um, should it be this or should you do, like, answer the case and then go to that, or like, how should you allocate? Okay, um, so in your negative speeches, I think the way to organize them is to put your offense first. So let's say in the 2NC, you want to take the case arguments and a disadvantage to the app. 
you should put your offense first because if you win, you're disadvantaged, but you don't effectively answer the case or you don't spend as much time on the case as you would have liked to, you can still win that debate but you, because you have offense against the affirmative's case. Think of this kind of like a basketball game. You can play really, really awesome defense, but if you are unable to score and make a basket, you will still lose the game. So you do need to have offense. You still need to run down there, shoot a couple baskets, and you generally want to think about doing that first, at least in debate, in order for you to have some points, and then you should be concerned about playing defense against the affirmative strongest arguments. Now to answer your, the first part of your question about what is most strategic to go for, I think the way you can kind of organize that is, one, what am I good at going for? What am I most comfortable going for? Two, what has the affirmative mishandled at answering? Where are their arguments weakest? And three, uh, what type of judge do I have in the debate? If I have a judge that knows nothing about critical theory, philosophy, this judge happens to be in love with capitalism, I should probably not go for the capitalism criticism. And for people in my lab, I will explain that a little bit more later on. Uh, but you should think about that, because if your judge has biases, and they will, they're human, they're not robots that are just typing out everything you say and then will, like, through an objective manner, reach a decision. They have subjective feelings that interfere with their logical decision. You have to take that into account. Uh, the kind of first part of that, what are you most comfortable with? The goal kind of throughout the year and throughout your career as a debater, especially if you're the second negative, but also if you're the first negative, is to diversify what you feel comfortable going for. So let's say right now you only feel comfortable in the 2 and R going for a disadvantage in case. Start kind of expanding that strategic thinking in some practice debates. These are especially good for that. Or at camp, or even during the year, if you feel like maybe you're going to beat this team anyways because you're just so much better than them. Try going for different types of arguments. Try going for a counter plan and disadvantage. Just try out a bunch of different things. And as you do that, your arsenal of negative arguments will expand, and you will be a more effective negative debater, not only in terms of your strategy, but it will influence what you can research, and it will also, also influence what you can execute within the debate round. So that part is very, very, very important. Uh, any other questions? OK, cool. Is there like, if you, if you like want to read anything as I wanted to like in a, as a time suck, like should you really like not do that ever? Or? Uh, I mean, it's not like a don't do that ever. Like be able to go for it if you, if you want but to. But it's usually useful to be able to go for it. All right. So I, I definitely understand that type of strategy. Like I do that as well. But the goal is to, you know, be able to utilize that time suck strategically. Yeah, if if I know. throw in like four arguments that are time sucks and what that term kind of refers to is a one in C argument that the two AC will spend such a tremendous amount of time answering it that it becomes unstrategic because they have now mishandled answering other arguments that you do want to go for in the one in C. So you can definitely do that, but if I throw out an argument that I can't go for, intending it to be a time suck, and the other team just calls your bluff, you're kind of regretting doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually happened to me uh, during the block. I included something in a speech, and this was like a pretty important debate for me. Uh, I included something in the speech that I knew, like, it was just like a silly argument. There was really no chance that I could actually go for it. And while I did like a decent job of arguing for it, the first affirmative rebuttal kind of called my bluff and was able to spend a lot of time on the real strategy and that made the two and R really, really difficult and we ended up losing that debate. So I would just be cognizant about the risks of trying to use time sucks 
uh, because it's really just a guessing game. I think they'll spend a lot of time on this. But, you know, if you can go for it and they do call your bluff, which really isn't a bluff at this point, that's when you can just put the pain down on them. Yeah. Just like put them in a world of hurt. And that is awesome and pretty easy to do. And that's all the part of the strategy that you think through before the debate. Alright. Does anybody have any other questions? Okie dokie. Um, oh, okay. So when like split in the block, mm -hmm. um, what do you like, like what do you think like should go first? Uh what which arguments to go first? Yeah, like 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 K's. Um, so in terms of organizing one's speech, I would do it in kind of the offense first, then defense kind of level. Um, in terms of which arguments to put in the 2 and C or 1 and R, um, really it's what is the 2 and going to be most effective at arguing and what is the 1 and going to be most effective at arguing. Uh, and the kind of second consideration is what will take the most time to prepare. So if I have an intricate case strategy that requires reading through a lot of the affirmative evidence that I can receive and read through during the debate, uh, as the 2N, I don't want to take like six minutes of prep time to go through that process. Giving that to the 1N to read and the 1 and R is a lot more useful because they have built in prep time before the speech. They have the eight minutes of the 2NC and the three minutes of cross-ex of the 2NC, so they already have 11 minutes of prep time to kind of go through, read the affirmative evidence for themselves so they can write out what they think the best arguments are, and then they can pick what is their best evidence to read in response to the AFS evidence. Um, so arguments that require more preparation time uh, generally should go to the first negative. Um, the politics DA, I think, is the perfect example of this. This is kind of the DA that you should be thinking about having for basically every tournament throughout the year. Even though I think it's kind of a crummy DA, a lot of debates can be won on the politics DA. Um, the benefit of giving that to the first negative rebuttal is that they can read through all the affirmative evidence that they've read in the 2AC to answer it. And by doing that, they can realize where their evidence is horrible, where they need to read more evidence. But if you're going to do that in the 2NC, it will require prep time if you want to give the same quality of speech and do the same quality of evidence comparison, uh, if everybody's kind of following that logic. Uh, any other questions? These have been really good questions so far, so, you know, even if you think it's dumb, keep them coming, because I promise you I've had the same question before in the past. <laughs> difficult part of the debate because this is all inside of the execution strategy this is and the question was how do you know what you're winning in the debate how do you know I'm guessing what are your strongest arguments what to go for in the block what to go for in the 2 and R this is kind of the tough part of the debate because you have to make that assessment during your prep time during the other person's speech and you're basically thinking about 20 different things at the same time and that is obviously very difficult to do so I think the most important aspect is the research phase of this. If you have researched the literature concerning a subject so thoroughly, and you have kind of internalized and you know what the best arguments are for and against this affirmative, then you are better able to assess not only your own arguments, what you think you're winning, but also what you think the affirmative's winning. And that second part is really important because if I think the affirmative is really strong on one argument that could kind of really hurt my DA, but I think the rest of their arguments are pretty bad, I can spend more time answering that one strong argument and kind of blow off the others. So I think research is kind of the answer to your question. 
It's the most important part of preparation because you can't develop good strategy without knowing what exists in the research base as well. Um, the second part of this is I think reading the affirmative evidence during the 1AC and kind of the evidence they read in the 2AC. Um, if you read their evidence and you realize that it is just god awful, you can like point that out and you can go like in your speech just like, look judge, their evidence is god awful. You should like prefer our evidence. It's from like 18 people with PhDs and they've been studying this since like the 40s. Like you can point all of that out, and that is really effective. But in order to be able to make those types of evidence comparisons, you need to have taken the time to kind of cursorily like read read through their evidence, and also take a gander at the qualifications listed for the authors of those evidence. If you realize that the majority of their evidence in the 1AC is from like shanes.blogspot.tumblr.com <laughs> and you like go to that website and you realize that most of it is just composed of a bunch of selfies but there's also this article about the Cuban embargo that he wrote for his seventh grade social studies class then you can be like whoa judge Shane no matter what he got on that book report in seventh grade is not qualified to be talking about the Cuban embargo you should prefer evidence and all of that is a process of kind of going through the evidence base both before and during the debate. And that can really, really, really help you know what you are effectively winning, which arguments you are doing really well on in the debate. Because generally, what you're doing well on will be what they're doing poor on, and what they're doing well on is generally something you're gonna be doing bad on, and you can kind of compensate once you know that. Um, this is also a reason why I think having saving Quite a bit of prep time for the two and R is really clutch. You should generally not take prep time for the one and C, and you should generally, although these are not hard and fast rules, they're probably more like guidelines, should not take prep for the one and R, uh, because the one and R already has a lot of inbuilt prep, and the one and C should kind of be like written before the debate. Once they've disclosed their affirmative, you can kind of think through what you want to put in the one and C. You're going to want to have quite a bit of prep time for the 2 and R. So you can discuss with your partner what you think the best arguments are, what you think you should be going for, and you can reread through the affirmative's evidence, through your evidence, and kind of make a decision about what the strongest set of arguments you've previously advanced in the debate are, and what, I, what you think you should be going for in the second negative rebuttal. And a lot of that process, like 90% of it, is done before the debate and outside of the debate because you should be planning from the 2 and R backwards during your strategy and research phase. Um, but yeah, no, the, the picking which things to go for, I like totally get. And honestly, for like my first like four years of debate, I made most of those decisions based on like, oh man, this argument is like real cool. I'm totally going to go for this. <laughs> and it would generally be like so dumb, but I mean we won a lot of those debates because it was kind of dumb. But I mean that's not like that's like ignore that. Um, <laughs> like there will be arguments that I'll research and I'll get like really 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 excited about it because I'm kind of like all over the place. Um, and then I'll want to go for that and I'll make that kind of emotional decision. But to make the kind of more logical, rational decisions uh, about what to go for just requires knowing a little bit which is why having four eyes in the back of your head and two on each side is really kind of useful because you can kind of see everything that's going on. Um, the other kind of suggestion for this, and this is really something that is developed over time, like I'm still like fairly poor at this, but the kind of like top levels of debaters in college are amazing at this, is kind of being able to not lose the forest for the trees. And what I mean by that is kind of see the debate from the top down. Look at the way the arguments on separate flows interact with each other. Even if the affirmative has only made four answers to a disadvantage that I've presented, but arguments on other flows interact with my ability to go for that disadvantage, I need to be able to kind of have a bird's eye view on the debate and see how these possible arguments could interact with each other. And that's just something that will develop over time as you get more experience within debate rounds. Uh, and as you do more practice speeches and rebuttal redos, that will also help out a lot. Um, I probably have time for about one more question. Okay, cool. Um,
um y'all will have labs i believe at the exact same time as every other day one p m with your lab leaders feel free to ask them any questions if you have any questions for me that you think of later do not hesitate to stop me in the dorm if you see me but everybody have a great rest of the day and enjoy lunch